Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Well, I got the you biggest think you laugh. You got the right angle. You got the biggest <laughs> laugh I got all night. Smiling. Mr. President, can you hold that up, please? Huh? Can you hold that up? Yeah. Is, that the way, <laughs> is that the way you practiced it? <laughs> no, I don't recall how I even did practice it. I just uh, knew what I was going to do when I found my ears on the floor. Been waiting for years to do it. <laughs> You've been having your troubles with the speaker in terms of, he said today that you were cruel to the poor, and, and Wright said uh, that uh, you're an alibi artist. Well, he wants well, Do you have when, any printable response? Uh, no, I, I thought once when uh, he had done something like that uh, earlier in, the, uh, in my term, and I called him because I thought we had a better relationship, why well, he just explained to me that that was just politics, and at 6 o'clock at night we were friends. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, does that change? Uh, I, uh, no, this wasn't 6 o'clock at night. Maybe he should have taped the show the night before. Maybe they had to be decent. But, uh, no, I, I could take issue with him on the things that he said. Uh, for example, let's take the years of 79 and 80, for which I can't be responsible. I wasn't here. And uh, a person at a pretty much poverty level, $10,000 income, in those two years, uh, had their purchasing power reduced to uh, $7,900 by inflation. If they were making $15,000, they had their purchasing power reduced to 12000 At 20000 they had it reduced to 16000 by two years of inflation. Well, now in a little more than two years, we've virtually eliminated inflation. Is that being unfair to the people in the lower and middle income brackets are tax policies. Uh, I believe that he's made it plain he would like to repeal the third year of the income tax. He would like to repeal indexing. Uh, if he did, 78% of all of that added tax burden would fall on the middle and lower income earners uh, from indexing and 72% would fall on the same people uh, from the cutting of the third year. What do you say to their, uh, they say there's some confusion about whether you really want uh, compromise and bipartisanship or confrontation and turning on and off the spigot, uh, as Wright was putting it. Yes, I, I heard him on television, uh, what he was saying on the House floor. I, I think he topped anything that I might have said in my speech to the home builders, which he was commenting on. but. Uh, no, we've had bipartisanship, and I asked for it in the State of the Union address. Now, their reply on their side was to simply go into committee and come forth with a Democratic version of the budget, uh, which they didn't con consult us on or attempt to make any bipartisan effort. But in reality, obviously there are differences between uh, two parties, or there wouldn't be two parties on domestic issues. The tradition that I have been appealing to and that has been successful, uh, and, I, and I have to express my gratitude to them for it, and that is that when you get to the water's edge on international affairs, we speak with one voice as Americans, not with any political differences. So on a bipartisanship, on their dealing with regard to Central America, uh, the MX and all, I think we've had it. But we've also had some good bipartisanship in domestic matters. The Social Security settlement, uh, the, the jobs bill, a number of things of that kind. Uh, so I'm not turning my back on bipartisanship. Mr. President, I brought along a few questions. All True right. or false? I thought you just asked them. <laughs> no, I'd like to ask you, how great do you think the recovery will be? And uh, how soon will it cut into the ranks of the 10 million plus unemployed? Well, I happen to be optimistic about it. I think we are on the way to a solid recovery, and I think maybe it's going to surprise uh, some people who are still being modest in the restaurants. With regard to the unemployed, however, uh, for a couple of reasons, this won't be as fast as we'd like. Number one, and traditionally, if you look back at all the other recessions, the last to recover is in the area of unemployment. That is the last economic indicator that, that catches up. 
But also, this time, I do think that there is a problem of, of uh, well, maybe two, two problems. There's one is a problem of structural unemployment. And that is new industries, new lines of work coming on scene and possible reductions in some other lines of work in which that's why we uh, made our principal attack on one of retraining to try and meet this structural problem. Coupled with that is the fact that we have had in just the last few years the greatest influx of people into the job market. It's hard to realize, but right now, with all of this unemployment, a higher percentage, or as high a percentage, uh, of the total pool of the employable, which is considered to be every one male and female from 16 to 65, today, with all this unemployment, we have a, as high or higher percentage of that overall pool employed than we have had in the past in times of full employment, which means that there are more people, I think it's very possibly the uh, more women attracted to the workforce, more young people going into it, and uh, uh, this must be counted. In other words, we have got to have an economic recovery that not only restores uh, what has been depressed, but that meets the problem of providing more and creating more new jobs. And uh, again, I'm optimistic there because in the last uh, three years, uh, there has been uh, the creation of new jobs. On the uh, subject of economics, what do you expect from the economic summit uh, in terms of results? And is there a tentative agreement among the seven nations to have some sort of a joint approach to economic recovery to minimize your differences on and monetary yeah. funds, as we saw. I think, I think this is something that uh, we all know we're going to talk about, but we've already made great progress at the ministerial level. The meetings of OECD and uh, the international financing uh, meetings, IMF and all of these things, there has been great agreement. And I think that uh, we are going to have a, a good meeting, and that's why we're having it, is to deal with those problems of how together since we're all faced with the same problems, there's probably among those nations 40 million unemployed. Um, that we've got to we've got to recognize that we must have recovery all together. Uh, Isn't there a lot of friction though in the? I don't really think so. In fact, uh, uh, I believe that we will probably come together uh, uh, with already more accomplished and. Uh, more recognition of our need for each other than in any of the summits that I've attended before. Is that right? Mr. President, on the Middle East, I'm taking the headlines, but um, what do you think is going to happen now and with the Syrian rejection of the pact? Uh, where do we go from here? Well, we're continuing to meet with uh, the our friends in the Arab world over there, and a number of those have made it plain that they do not agree with Syria's position. And I am hopeful that Syria will not want to become isolated from its Arab neighbors. Uh, we've made an agreement now that uh, is based on guaranteeing the, uh, the sovereignty uh, of an Arab state, Lebanon, and the other Arab states, uh, Jordan. Well, if Syria Jordan. won't accept uh, Habib, would you send someone else? Or, or I mean, will well, they accept anyone else? Well, the, Phil is going on to Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, they could, they've made a suggestion. This could be looking for uh, something. Uh, they've uh, made a suggestion for someone else, you mean? Uh, well, now maybe I'm. Public suggestion they did. What? So that the public, they said send shorts. Yes, that they, that the secretary. Now, this may just be that they want to be. Uh, since he was there for the original agreement of the, between the other two, that they may think that he must be present. For, Are you going to send him back? Syria. Well, we'll look and see when, uh, if that's called for, of course, he, he'd go in a minute. How about the uh, 75 F-16s to Israel? Are you going to release those tomorrow? Or? We, uh, 
We are in the consultation with the Congress right now, and as you know, the law requires a notification from us to Congress, and uh, uh, we're in consultation right now, and I think that consultation should be ended uh, in a day or two. And so then you will notify Congress? Yes. I have to get to the re-election question, friend. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't uh, foresee that. If, when do you think you'll announce for re-election? I haven't even decided that. Really? I know that there's a time coming soon when I must, in all fairness. Is soon before Labor Day? Uh, I honestly couldn't say. I haven't uh, talked with anyone or strategized with anyone. I'm just going ahead with the day-to-day -day job that has to be done here. You know we're all wondering about it. I do. If you decide to run for re-election, would you win? Well, I've never gone into a game of any kind without uh, going into win. So you think you would, based on your polls and so forth? You 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 trapped me a little <coughs> bit there because you know I'm also. I hope one, I did. You know that I'm also one who has that, from my sports background, has that feeling of not wanting to jinx myself. <laughs> Do you jinx yourself when you say you win? Well, you know, it's a little bit like in baseball, the old thing of if a pitcher is pitching a no-hit game, you never mention it. Well, the game is going on because that'll jinx it and so forth. So uh, it's things of that kind. I've always been a little leery about uh, Same. Uh, predicting things. But like you've that. never predicted no. a defeat. No. Are you grooming uh, George Bush as your heir apparent if you don't run? Oh, I think that'd be a decision for uh, him to make. But I must say that, as I have already stated, uh, I think that uh, what he's doing, that we have a fine partnership here, and he, is, uh, he has been just super as, as a vice president. And you think that he's won over the right to the ultra-conservatives? Oh, I think certainly uh, some people who were doubtful at first must see him in a different light in view of uh, all that he has done. My last question, I think, on that subject is, if you're not running, why are you wooing so many of your past supporters and campaigners? Well, maybe I'm just rewarding them. <laughs> <laughs> with your presence? No, with a visit to the White House. <laughs> well, they all seem pretty fired up about going forward again. Oh, I know. They were asking me some of the questions, same questions you've been asking. And you didn't give them any no, satisfaction? No, they were getting the same answers you've been getting. <laughs> Do you think your age would be a factor? And uh, do you think your health could stand it mentally and physically for the long haul? Heavens, yes. I've never felt better in my life than I feel now. Uh, That's not typical of presidents. Well, it is At me. this stage of the game. It is of me. I uh, uh, got a little gym up there. I work out every day and uh, uh, actually uh, I didn't think at uh, this stage of your life you uh, built muscle, but uh, if I don't watch out, I'm going to have to have some coats altered. So you don't feel that uh, the age would be a factor? No. And I stopped to think of the age of some people like Adenauer when he was serving Germany and uh, Ingdes. Churchill. Uh, greatest, not only Churchill, but Gladstone and others. Uh, no, I don't think uh, today that's a factor. On Central America, Mr. President, are you willing to go along with proposals for unconditional talks between all sides uh, in El Salvador without any conditions? No. No, I, I think, no, the unconditional talks, I don't think people realize what this implies. We have an armed guerrilla force that is seeking to take over power out of the barrel of a gun. To, and yet we have a government that has opened itself to elections that is an elected government with more than 80% of the people turning out to vote. Uh, they are having another election to elect a president before the year is out. Now, the unconditional thing would be bringing these armed groups in as a force in an attempt to divide up uh, the roles of government and form a coalition with them without the consent of the people. And I think the negotiation should be the very kind that the government of El Salvador has agreed to. Granting amnesty 
They lay down their guns, guaranteeing amnesty for them to come in and participate in the political, submit themselves to the voters. If they've got candidates that they want to run for election, come in and use the democratic process. The, my memory goes back to one time in which our government did the other of what they're talking about. It was in Laos. When Laos, the government of Laos was beset by the path at Lao, the communist-backed uh, uh, guerrillas in their country. And uh, a, a coalition, with our help, a coalition was put together. No voting of the people or anything. And in a very short time, uh, the path at Lao was in charge. Well, I think that uh, Ambassador Stone sort of indicated that you might go for the unconditional talks, but without power sharing. So well, that if I think maybe he's saying the same thing uh, that uh, I'm saying and uh, interpreting the unconditional talks, then... Well, then would the war be the only way to stop the real challenge of Marxism in Central America? The... This is what has been imposed on Central America. The radicals, the groups that are... Uh, that are battling with the government, uh, not on the same extent or level, but in a minor way, harassing the governments of Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala. They are coming from the same source. They are encouraged by and helped by Nicaragua, the government of Nicaragua. Um, they have the same uh, background of training and being armed by the, those other forces. And my belief is that all of us must stay together uh, resist this so that we can go forward with the pursuit of democracy. Is there a possibility states. to win? Well, look, there's Costa Rica. Costa Rica is probably the, the oldest democracy there. It doesn't even have an army. Honduras has come from a military dictatorship to democracy. Guatemala is doing the same thing. El Salvador has done it already and has a government that is the result of, of an election. Now all of them in their efforts to bring about a better social order and a better standard of living for their people, improved economic conditions, all of these things are delayed by the armed forces. When the guerrillas in El Salvador uh, destroy the power plants and industries have to close down and people are unemployed and out of work because of it, uh, this is counter to what everyone wants to accomplish there. This is why uh, our ratio of aid in the area is three-fourths to economic development and help of that kind and only one-fourth to military. But you have to put up a shield so that these democratic processes can go forward. Uh, you can have land reform as they have in El Salvador. They've given land to 25,000 people or more. But what about the fellow? <laughs> that can't go out and farm that land or he gets shot in the head because it's part of the battleground with the guerrillas. Mr. President, why do you reject negotiations with the Soviets on the next generation of nuclear space weapons uh, with the chance that those negotiations could lessen future dangers to the world? Uh, why couldn't you begin right now discussing space nuclear weapons with the Soviets and verifiability at the same time? Well, we have an awful lot on the plate right now in the uh, balanced forces, the conventional forces negotiations that are going on. Then in the two areas, the intermediate range and the strategic range, the START talks, the INF talks. Don't they uh, all, aren't they in the same mix though, really? Yes, but you know, you have to, uh, you, can, you can move from one to the other, but also we have wanted to discuss uh, verifiability, improved verifiability on testing, and the Soviet Union has refused to, to discuss this with us. Uh, they, there's no discussion going on, and uh, by their choice, so... Uh, they won't discuss it at all? Uh, not the improved verifiability of testing, things of that kind, no. They just said there's, they won't discuss it. So you don't uh, think that uh, this whole business of uh nuclear uh, vehicles in space is really well, adding to the danger? Well, they're the only ones that have so far tested and demonstrated that they have 
satellite killers, in other words, weapons that they can send up in space and knock down satellites. And uh, there is an agreement now between all the nations that space is off limits uh, as to military action. Now, uh, if we're not going to be permitted to, uh, to verify what they are doing uh, in that regard, I don't, I don't see where there's a, an area for us to, to negotiate. Do you have any policy of launch on warning? And do you take seriously the Soviet threat of a launch on warning if, if we deploy the Pershing and cruise missiles in Europe by the end of the year? Well, evidently they must be interpreting uh, launch on warning as simply being that they would take the deployment of missiles as a warning to them. Well, they've had and have now Do you think they take it that, uh, that way? Well, it must be their interpretation because they've said the one thing that if we deploy, that there will be retaliation. Well, we're going to deploy. At the same time, we're going to continue negotiating. They have more than 1,300 warheads aimed at all the targets of Western Europe. And they were adding to those all during the time that these INF talks have been going on. They have continued to add the SS-20s uh, targeted on Europe to their arsenal. We have zero. What and kind I, of retaliation do you think that they would resort to? I think what, what do you mean a uh, launch on warning? Does that well, mean that? I think what, what I believe that we would interpret launch on warning to mean is that if we were sitting here, for example, and we had verified that they had pushed the button and their missiles were on the way. Then the thing is, do you sit here and wait till their missiles land or do you, uh, do you shoot your missiles at them? Because the targets for both sides are each other's missiles. And uh, do you sit here and let yours get blown up to the place that they then have you at their mercy and can say now, surrender? Do you know what you would do under those circumstances? Yes, but I don't think I should say it. <laughs> Have there been any close calls? I don't know of any. In your own as presidents? No, 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 none. Or any real threat. But in terms of, of the Russians, if we do deploy, do you think that they would take some strong action? Well, this is what they've said. I can't believe it. But what I do believe is that all of their, all of their protests, uh, all of their propaganda in Western Europe, aimed at the governments of Western Europe, their attempt to influence the election in Western Germany, all was based on trying to turn the, our NATO allies around so that they would ask us not to deploy. Now remember, the deployment of those weapons is at the request of our allies. They are the ones... Are they willing to say so? Oh, they have openly. They asked us for those weapons to be a deterrent force to the And will SS that be units. reaffirmed at the Senate? At the, I'm sorry, at the summit? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, we know that, yes, all of our, uh, our NATO allies are in agreement with us on uh, going forward with the deployment. Frankly, I am optimistic rather than being frightened by anything they're saying. I believe they feel so strongly about that, that maybe we won't make progress until deployment starts. When they see we're really going to deploy, maybe then we'll really get into some negotiations. And when you give them support was, we're convinced that dialogue is the best way to advance the cause of peace. Yes. The question is, why don't you meet with Andropov and personally explore his views, and get acquainted, see if there's room for accommodation and detente, and why do you have to have everything settled by your lieutenants before you meet? You're not doing that at the economic summit. Well, if you look back at the history of summits, uh, I remember one previous president, and I won't name him, but uh, he had a summit just for the sake of having a summit and getting acquainted. And expectations were raised because most people, well, I think everyone assumes that if you go there, you go there to settle something. And, and I don't think that's something. necessarily true. Well, uh, You've already yes. laid down the edict on the economic summit that uh, it well, might be just a talk. But in that, in, that present, in that case that I mentioned, in that previous case, the letdown and the disappointment worldwide was so great that it was, uh, that the summit meeting was not only not profitable, it was counterproductive. 
And I believe that, um, uh, I think the, that a summit is, is likely, I, I can't give you a time, but I think you have to have an agenda in which you both agree that there are some things that you can probably resolve uh, by meeting, and then you get together and meet. But so far, there has been no indication of that. Uh, Do you think it's possible this year? I would not be optimistic about this year. Poss more possibility of next year. But the, uh, and I think that part of it is legitimate. I don't think it's a reluctance on their part. If you, if you watch what's going on over there, it's apparent that uh, Andropov is, is setting himself into his government, making the changes he believes should be made. Have you had any contacts with him, correspondence, as you did with Brezhnev? Uh, no, I don't recall any direct uh, correspondence with him, but there is great cable traffic back and forth, and we have a number of channels open. We're, we're in contact at every level. How about uh, Castro? Would you talk to him concerning, since you think that uh, Cuba is a chief fulminer of strife in uh, yeah. Central America, would you ha have a dialogue with him? We actually tried to make contact, and uh, it amounted to nothing very early on. Uh, when actually, he was, back when he was uh, doing all that fantastic uh, predicting that we were planning an invasion or something. And uh, there just is no, there's no contact with him. Uh, 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 then let me look at my best right? question to see. Um, gosh, they're all good. Let's see. Mr. Pre uh, President, um, several years ago, Henry Kissinger gave uh, Israel a memo promising the U.S. would not talk to the Palestinian representatives until they had recognized the existence of Israel. And you and your uh, predecessors have followed that. My question, Mr. President, is what Israel should the Palestinian representatives recognize? It's the Israel of 47 partition plan, Israel of 48 war, Israel of a 67 war, 73, or the annexation of Syria's Golan Heights, or the Israel of 83? Well, I, I think that I don't, we're talking there about uh, previous wars and things that are going on. I think it's been the same Israel uh, all the time, and I think it simply has to be what Sadat was willing to do, what uh, Jemayel and Lebanon have done, uh, and that is to simply recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation. Now, that doesn't mean that you foreclose the door on negotiating with regard to uh, occupied territories or anything, but just that uh, remember that the concept under which all those other wars were, were fought was a concept that, uh, that the Arab nations at that time had said uh, they reject the existence of Israel as a nation, the right of Israel to exist so as a nation. So it would be uh, right as a nation without uh, any particular right. bound borders. That's right. You don't prejudice in any way the negotiations, as uh, Sadat did not. Sadat said, all right, let's come together and talk. And the result of it was that uh, the Sinai was given back. Well, what about what's going to happen on the West Bank? Will the settlements continue? Are you going to well, do anything seems, about it? It seems they're planning, but that again, the West Bank, I think, is one of the items to uh, be negotiated and what we've been waiting on the settlement of this Lebanon uh, issue for. Um, and this was where King Hussein, once this is settled, is prepared, uh, what he wants to know is that he has support from the other Arab states in representing the Palestinians. Obviously, they're situation of the Palestinian people must be uh, treated with in these negotiations. Uh, Israel has made it plain that they're continuing to go forward with these settlements. I would hope that once the negotiations start, that then they would stop. Won't that be too late? There might be a de facto annexation by then. Well, I don't think they can get people in there that fast. They, uh, they're. You know, there's quite a population of more than a million people already in the West Bank. Well, I always have to sneak a question. What are you going to do uh, when your presidency is over? Just go back to the ranch and enjoy everything? Or, uh, or work? 
That I'd like very much. <laughs> yes. Rest a little while. And, and we don't get enough time there. Thank you very much. I right. really appreciate it. I don't even know how to close this thing. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Let's see, you want to stop? It must be some way or other. Anyway, thank you a lot. <laughs> All right. I guess I have to go into the electronics business. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>